I think everybody does it for fun. And if it's not fun, you shouldn't do it. Welcome to the Brand New Me Podcast. I'm Francis, And I'm Pam. And we are two women passionate about helping others thrive in life, not just survive. In each episode, we're going to find creative ways to offer hope for your future through our own life experiences. So join us every week as we learn together that we really can be a brand new me. You give us reasons why we create, but tell us, why do you create? What's your reasoning for creating? What happens in your brain? Well, I create because I cannot not create, if that makes any sense. It just happens in my brain. I can't sit around and just not do it unless I am super tired or just need a break from the process of being creative. And that happens sometimes. And I would just rather watch TV or or play a video game or something like that. But I create because I always have. I don't know another way. It's like asking people why they like to exercise or asking people why they do any hobby or special thing that they do or unique kind of book they like to read. It's just what I do. It's who I am. And yeah, Uh, I do it for fun. I think everybody does it for fun. And if it's not fun, you shouldn't do it. And this is one of the things that I have another book that I'm working on. I'm not sure if I'm going to publish it or not because it's, it's pretty rough read, but it's called The Straight Truth. And the bottom line is if you don't enjoy what you're doing, if you're only doing it for money or for fame and you don't enjoy it, then there's no reason you should be doing it. If it's work, that you're doing for money, that might be another thing. But as far as creative, uh, artistic things, if you aren't making them because you absolutely cannot help but make them, that doesn't sound like a true artist to me. That doesn't sound like a true creative. That sounds just like someone who is doing something because they can, because someone told them they should, or some other reason. So we had a conversation about this, uh, Francis and I did, about should our ministries be fun? Like, should we always enjoy what we're doing? And I'm not sure we came to a conclusion with that, did we? I feel like we decided that there are seasons when it'll be fun, but there are times when it turns into sheer work. In my opinion, we made a commitment to do something. And if we want to follow it through and see it through to the end, there is a point where I, th- I think it, it's hard work. But that's getting us off track from what Eric has been saying. He gives four reasons why he thinks we create. One, we do it for fun. Two, we do it for recognition, but not so much that we become paralyzed by what others think. Well, Eric, have you ever been paralyzed by what others think? I wouldn't say I've ever been paralyzed. I would say that I've been discouraged when you get a word back from a publisher that someone told you is going to love your stuff and they send you back and say we we just don't have any interest or they don't send anything back at all and i think any creative or artist who has submitted anything for publication or anything to a website or to the radio or to anything and not received anything back that can really um discourage you but i i seldom am paralyzed by someone else's uh, thoughts about my art. I've had plenty of people tell me how much they hate it, especially since there's another artist with my name who makes this rock kind of animal noise music stuff. And boy, those people really hate my smooth, jazzy Christian stuff. I'll tell you that much right now. But I don't know if it paralyzes me because I know it's not going to affect me much at all. And I think true artists don't let that kind of stuff affect them. They shake it off, they go create something else, something new. Uh, Many times, as a matter of fact, you know, I went down to Nashville many times 
to try to talk to publishers about my songs that I was creating. And I started making relationships, started going to different kinds of conferences. And as it turned out, all those trips to Nashville and back to Kentucky, where I was from, and I would go back more and more emboldened to just do my own thing. The trips down to Nashville were all about what could happen. And the trips back to Kentucky, back to my hometown, were all about what will happen. Because I knew what I could control. And I was not going to let this either negative response or no response or whatever uh, someone else's idea of what I should be doing change what I wanted to do, which was just create things. And this is one of the reasons that Eric Copeland inspires me, because I'll just be honest with you all and tell you that I am I am not like Eric. When someone discourages me in my music or tells me I need to do something better or I could write the song better, what I tend to do is say, okay, tell me how to improve, and I'll work like the Dickens to make it what you think it should be. And I'll just tell you, I think sometimes I've gotten off track because I've paid so much attention to what other people say about my art that it can throw me into a frenzy. So I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, for anyone else who may hear Eric say that and think, man, he sounds like he doesn't struggle much. That's kind of the way Eric is. He's just He just keeps going no matter what, where I tend to be more... I guess like a sponge where I will just soak in what someone has just told me and say, okay, I'll try to do better. In fact, I remember when someone critiqued my, one of my first albums, I actually, I think it was my second album. His critique was good grief, Francis. These songs make me want to pull over and slit my wrist. (laughs) (laughs) I'm being honest. I should say his critiques of my music were so hard on me that I, in the end, said, should I give up doing this? He said, oh, my goodness, no. I'm just telling you how to how I think you could improve as an artist. Just for what it's worth, we're all different. We're all wired different. We receive things different. Pam, how do you react when, if you've had someone speak negatively about your creation? I think I probably have a pity party first. And think, you know, who are they to tell me? (laughs) And then I do take them into consideration and get a grip and just say, okay, what can I do about this? And does it really matter what this person thinks? That's the other thing you have to caveat, you have to think about. Like, who's telling you this? Uh, Are they a trusted friend? Are they somebody you really uh, admire? Somebody who you would take criticism from that you feel like, Yeah, they know what they're talking about. Sometimes it's not that. Sometimes it's just somebody spouting off, and you have to know when to recognize when to take criticism and when not to. So, Eric, do you ever get stuck? Like, sometimes I feel like I'm stuck in a place where I can't get out of or in a hole that I can't climb out of. Tell us how you feel about that. Do you ever feel stuck? Whenever I get stuck, what unsticks me is to create something new. Well, okay then. It's just that simple. I get that. If I can extract myself from the disappointment and the unstuckness, it does help to start. All I have to do is when I start a new song, I get new energy, I get new new ideas, and I, I get that. As a music producer or a creative who is paid to create, I can create on demand after two decades of practice. But for most people who don't do it for a living, it's very tough to create on demand. But I would say if you're a painter and you set up an easel and you start to put stuff on the canvas, even if it's not what you wanted, it'll be something. If you're a writer and you sit down and you just stream of consciousness, start to write out a story or some thoughts, it's something. If you're a songwriter and you just put your hands down on the piano or the guitar and you start to play, something is going to come out. It may not be the greatest song you've ever written or the greatest painting or book you've ever written or... It may not be great at all, but it will be something, and it will be a release of creative energy, and you've got to do that. You've just got to keep doing it. There's no other answer. There's no other possible way to get yourself unstuck other than just unsticking. Creating is the way that you get past the problem of, I'm not creating, and 
I'm not sure how else I could answer that other than to say, again, it's all about the work. You got to put in the work of creating in order to get unstuck. This is good, Eric. Can you elaborate even more? Maybe another way to approach getting unstuck. You completely strike out in a new direction. You think about that thing that you've always wanted to do, and maybe it's not even, if you're a musician, maybe it's not even a music thing. Maybe you want to write a book. Maybe you've always wanted to paint. Maybe you've always wanted to draw or to write a book. Or maybe you've always wanted to act or to dance or to preach or something. And um, sometimes just looking into what it would take to do those things it either You either look at it and you go, oh, no, that's way too much work. Or you go, you know what? I think I have something to offer in this area. And then you can come back to your music or your painting or whatever it was that you set aside and say, what? how can I put these two things together now? Sometimes you can start as an artist making albums and become an artist who is doing a show every year, this big, gigantic show. <clears throat> we won't mention any names. And then sometimes you need to get unstuck from that other thing that you start and go back to something else. And that's all part of the creative process. And it's all part of being a creative person. And I think that happens. That's exactly why I'm going to give up portraits of white. And I think I'll go learn how to build high rise buildings in the city. Just something totally new. That is. Pam, what, what's going to be your new artistic adventure? I'm going to become a dancer. <laughs> you are. <laughs> You've already done that. And I'm going to get a 4-4 four four and I'm going to do ballet. <laughs> <laughs> what is a 4-4? Four four? And not a 2-2. Two two. It's a little bit bigger. <laughs> oh, a t- are you being serious? There is such a thing as a 2-2 two yeah, two and a 4-4? Four four? No, Francis, I'm not. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> so, Eric, question. Is it normal to feel like you're not making a difference in the world? With your creativity? I think it's easy to think no one's listening, to think no one's seeing or or reading or hearing the art that you're making. Absolutely. But you fix that by putting more stuff out, by getting out on a street corner if that's what you got to do and being artistic in front of people, by putting stuff out on your Facebook page and out on your YouTube and then telling your family, if no one else, to go listen. Go listen to this and tell me what your thoughts are. People will listen and will comment if they think something is, if they are asked. Oh, brother. <laughs> Just what we didn't want to hear, right, Francis? <laughs> Okay, let's let's ask a different question. Like, what do you like for supper, Pam? <laughs> let's get off the whole idea of creativity and work. It's getting too hard. So what are you having for supper, Pam? I'm having a pork roast with oh. potatoes and broccoli. <laughs> it's all planned right up here in this steel trap. Steel <laughs> trap? Your brain is a steel trap. (laughs) So in other words, the pot roast isn't cooked yet. You're going to do it when you get home. My supper is in the crock pot already. Oh my goodness. Well, I hope this has been helpful. And if you are putting stuff out there, how do you deal with rejection and and people who maybe really just don't care for what you're doing? And uh, I hope this has been good. It's obvious you can probably see that we're all wired different and Eric's just wired different than the rest of us, I think so. All right, we will see you next week. And by the way, I'm not giving up portraits of white. That was a joke. 